Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to our talk tonight. I'm Vivian New, uh, the chapter president. This is actually going to be the last talk where I am chapter president because I wrap up at the end of the year. And I also wanted to thank Madeline Morrow for letting me host today because we she had actually signed up to do it. But I love Edgewood. I know this talk, I'm just excited about Stu being here. And I really wanted um, to, to host tonight. So she was kind enough to let me take that on. And let me see, can I get my slides to, uh-oh, what is going on here? There we go. Uh, but before we get started, I wanted to acknowledge that the work done by the Santa Clara Valley Chapter of CNPS lies in the homeland of the Muwekma Ohlone, the Amamutsin Tribal Band, the Tamian Nation, and the Ramayatush Ohlone. This land was theirs for thousands of years and was taken forcibly from them. Despite two centuries, of oppression and genocide, they still live and thrive in this area today. We acknowledge and respect them for their land stewardship, their culture, language, and humanity. The Santa Clara Valley chapter of CNPS hopes to learn from them and support their work to restore traditional practices and heal from historical trauma. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we would love to know how you found out about us and where you are. So if you are comfortable doing it, please share that information in chat. And our team tonight is myself, the host, Vivian, and uh, I'm also covering the technology part of it. So I'm running Zoom. Our QA moderator, Judy Fennerty, our YouTube moderator, Madeline Ramirez, and our speaker, Stu Weiss. If you are not familiar with CNPS, we are a nonprofit environmental organization. We were founded in 1965. We have over 10,000 members, 35 chapters covering all of California and Baja California. Our chapter is the Santa Clara Valley chapter, and we cover Santa Clara County and Southern San Mateo County. And what is CNPS about? Well, our mission is to save California's native plants and their habitats. And we do that through science, education, conservation, and gardening. If you are not a member, we would absolutely love to have your support of our, our work. Uh, if you're, when you become a member, you get two amazing journals, Artemisia, which has a little bit more of a scientific bent, and Flora, which has lots of wonderful gardening information. It's a beautiful, beautiful magazine. You would also receive our chapter newsletter, The Blazing Star, which tells you about all of our events and also has a lot of really interesting articles. And there are a bunch of local nurseries who offer discounts to members. So uh, please consider supporting us by joining if you are not currently a member. We have, um, we are at the end of the year, so it's December, a little bit of a quiet time, but we do have a few more events coming up. On Friday, we have our photo group meeting. If you like to look at pretty plant pictures or if you yourself are a photographer and would like to share pictures, please consider joining. You can find information about it on our website. Um, we don't normally advertise our committee meetings, but I just thought I wanted to put a plug in for those of you who might be interested in helping to organize these talks, or if you have an idea for a talk that you would like to have us uh, offer, please consider joining our committee. We're meeting on Monday at 7.30 on Zoom. Um, you can find information about that on our website. And then we wrap up the year with an in-person field trip at Lake Cunningham. So that is on Saturday, December 18th at nine in the morning. Um, it's not drop-in, you do have to sign in, so you'll have to go on Meetup and sign up for it. And uh, if you do not, if, well, let me, actually, let me go to the, oops. Hold on, I mess up here. Sorry about that. Um, all of this information is available on our chapter website, cnps-scv.org. We also put our events on meetup.com. Um, I've got QR codes down there, so you can get to those very directly um, through the QR code. And if you're not on our chapter um, news mailing list, could please consider getting on it because you'll get a little reminder once a week about what's going on. Our nursery um, is open for online sales right now. We are closing for the holidays, in other words, for the rest of the year, next Wednesday on December 15th. So there is rain in the forecast, guys. So this is the time, buy your plants. Uh, you could do that 
and get them in the ground and take advantage of the rain. We also have a very limited supply of bulbs still available. So consider just shooting on over to our nursery, which is um, the QR code is there, the URL is there, or you can just simply go to our website, cnps-scv.org, and there's a link to get to it. There's also t-shirts, books, um, and signs as well that you can order from the store. Aha, I've got, I changed the order of my slides, that's why I was confused. So as I mentioned before, uh, if you are not currently on our chapter news mailing list, please consider joining because that is the easiest way to stay in touch with what's going on, including announcements about upcoming talks. And if you are taking horticulture somewhere in our chapter area or our chapter member and are taking horticulture somewhere, uh, you might want to consider applying for our brand new scholarship. You can do that through the end of January. So if you or somebody you know is studying horticulture and interested in native plants, so the native plant part is really important, please consider applying for our scholarship. And a little bit of housekeeping before we get to the talk. So please mute your mics, uh, but if you have any questions, for Stu, just type them into the chat anytime. We are monitoring it and we will be asking Stu the questions at the end of his talk. And we do expect to wrap up by nine o'clock. So this uh, talk, if you were here on Zoom, if you're on YouTube, you already know this, is also being um, shown on YouTube and it will be available for later viewing. So you can always go back and watch it again. And if you wanna share it with a friend, um, just let them know that it's available on YouTube. All right, well, I am so excited to have Stu here. Stu is uh, the leader of Creekside Science. He is also in charge of this restoration going on at Edgewood. He is, there is such innovative work that he's been doing. He is amazing and I am simply thrilled to have him here tonight. So Stu, take it away, please. Okay, so uh, you see my title slide there? Yeah, looks good. Okay, great. Okay, so um, I'm gonna give an update on uh, project 467, um, which is enhancing native plant diversity and what I call the coefficient of beauty at Edgewood Natural Reserve. Uh, I'm a big fan of judging environmental quality by the coefficient of beauty, that feeling you get when you're in a field of wildflowers and the colors are just tickling your eyeballs. Um, and that's what we want to try to expand at Edgewood. So uh, no introduction is really needed with this crowd at Edgewood. Um, they're also known as Area 467. Um, that's not because there are space aliens coming in, although sometimes between like Ken Himes and uh, Paul Heipel, I, I really wonder what planet they're from, but it's uh, because it's 467 acres. And uh, Project 467 is basically trying to look at the entire park or natural preserve. Uh, so the history, it was saved from a golf course uh, in the mid 80s and early 90s. Um, the Save Edgewood Park Coalition uh, morphed into the Friends of Edgewood in 1993 and really began to uh, steward the park. And Friends of Edgewood is a very high capacity friends group. There are friends groups all across the country, you know, friends of this park, friends of this river, et cetera. Um, I think Friends of Edgewood is in the very, very top tier in terms of uh, commitment and capacity. Um, it's been an amazing community to be a part of over the decades. 
So Edgewood is most famous for its serpentine grasslands, um, easy to love ecosystem, full of tidy tips, uh, Berdia there, um, beautiful setting, uh, looking at the Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, we get up close and personal with the little owls peeking out of the owl's clover among the uh, left the siphon here. It's just beauty in at so many different scales and uh, different seasons. Uh, when we really get down into the grassland with the uh, dwarf brodea, you know, we take the lotus position to use the old name for that little legume there. Um, the royal larkspurs really grab people's attention. So the serpentine grasslands are you know, really, really spectacular. And it's been home to the bay checker spot butterfly. I'm not going to go into the history of the butterfly very much. Uh, its main host plant is the, the dwarf plantain, Plantago erecta, which is the silvery plant uh, right below the butterfly there. Uh, largely, it is restricted to serpentine soils. Uh, because of the presence of the Plantago erecta and nectar sources on the serpentine. And, you know, the nectar sources are abundant and varied. We have the tidy tips, we have the uh, Lasthenia, um, pretty wide variety of wildflowers they get nectar from. And uh, there in the background is the looming shadow of uh, Highway 280 and the story of how the auto emissions from Highway 280 led to grass invasion uh, on the serpentine soils uh, and um, how we were learned how to mow and control the grass for at least a few years at a time. Um, that's maybe next year I'll uh, come back and talk more about that. But it's basically uh, you know, the car exhaust and smog in general is fertilizer in the form of nitrogen oxides and ammonia. And it uh, fertilizes these nutrient poor soils allowing the grasses to really take and we've been trying to reintroduce the bay checker spot butterfly it went extinct in 2002, um, starting in 2007, but really getting going in 2011. Um, we did, we stopped translocating in 2017. The population is barely hanging on. And to uh, quote Monty Python's Flying Circus, we're not dead yet, but pretty close. And this has been an uphill battle with climate change, really climate whiplash going from you know, extreme drought to extreme deluge, warm temperatures, um, really erratic environment. There's the ongoing nitrogen deposition from Highway 280, which requires continual uh, rotational mowing and the fact that we have such a small area, about 40 acres of uh, serpentine grassland in the core area um, compared to thousands of acres on Coyote Ridge. Um, maybe save that one for next year. Another species we've taken on is the San Mateo Thornmint. And this is a story of intervention that has saved this plant from extinction. The only known occurrence uh, that was left is at Edgewood. Um, it's a beautiful, subtle little uh, little annual mint. Um, in this photo on the right, you're seeing more plants in that photo than existed in 2009. In 2009, there are 200. 49 plants, we counted them all in one site, and they occupied about 27 square meters. By 2021, after um, seed uh, increases and out seeding uh, plants, finding new places with the right uh, soils, 
Uh, we have about 30,000 plants in six sites, and it's occupying uh, well more than 5,500 square meters. Um, I really think we've saved this plant from extinction. And, uh, project, uh, everybody involved in it should be really proud of. And to emphasize that in 2021, there were 38 plants in the original occupied habitat, which was on the order of nine square meters. But we want to look beyond the serpentine. I mean, serpentine's easy to love and enjoy, but we want to look at these more fertile grasslands. Uh, I, I got tired of calling them non-serpentine grasslands and decided that they're more fertile soil, so let's just call them fertile grasslands. And they pose a lot of really major issues for uh, management and restoration. They're dominated by non-native species and um, it can be very, very difficult to increase the cover of native species in them. And that's really what we're trying to do here. Um, one of the amazing things at Edgewood has been the decades long uh, work of the weed warriors. Um, they really tackled the macro weeds. And what I mean by a macro weed is something that you, know, you can pull up or dig out. Uh, it, it's large enough that um, it can be attacked by hand. And it's tens of thousands of volunteer hours over about 30 years, and it really is incomparable. Uh, people from outside the Edgewood community come to Edgewood and are just amazed at the lack of uh, various thistles and uh, weeds that are quite common elsewhere. So uh, that's been great because we've gotten rid of one problematic set of plants largely and it's at the point where it's on uh, early detection and rapid response. Um, there's so many eyes out there. And if, a, you know, if a new patch of yellow star shows up, uh, somebody will be on it. Um, I remember one day I was out there, we came across some uh, narrow leaf clover, a small patch of it. And, uh, Next time we were out, we pulled somebody, and actually Trevlin had noticed it. Next time we were out, it was gone. But we have the micro weeds. You know, these are the annual grasses and small forbs that really form the bulk of the fertile grassland flora in terms of biomass. Um, particularly problematic species is the Brachypodium distachyon, a uh, purple false brome, which over the course of a couple decades has really taken over the fertile grasslands in Edgewood. Um, over on the right, you can see it creates this very, very dense thatch that smothers out uh, the other plant diversity, including a lot of the other weeds. And this is the kind of species you can't control by hand. Same thing with uh, the erodia, the, uh, the cat's claws, uh, a lot, some of the non-native clovers are just really hard to control uh, by hand or impossible to control by hand unless you're working on the scale of just a few meters. So um, first thing we needed to do with project 467 or the green grass project as Bill Corpoltz uh, came up with as a moniker for it was to find out what's out there and where is it. So it's, it's basically an inventory of uh, the fertile grasslands at Edgewood. So uh, there's Perry McCarty and Al Fengler, we were the RAP team, and we went out and did about 80 rapid assessment plots, uh, which is kind of a CMPS relevate technique where you score the cover of species on a 
on a cover scale that is a good balance between getting the information you want about relative cover, but also makes it go fast enough you can do a lot of plots. And I would call our days when we go out there our voyage of discovery, because we'd go into a corner of the park and we would just start doing these rap plots um, and find, you know, like really, really interesting species. Um, we would sample the different kinds of environments. We'd be up on the south facing slopes to get a hot, dry environment. We'd be over on a north facing slope to get a cooler environment. We'd be down in the swale bottoms getting a moist environment would be up on the ridge tops getting a, a dry environment and we came up with 146 species um, in our plots we had 18 native perennial grasses rushes and sedges we had 37 native perennial forbs, 43 native annual forbs. And some of these were really spillover from the adjacent serpentine grasslands, but we did find uh, some annual forb species that were quite characteristic of the fertile grasslands. Then on the dark side, uh, we had 15 non-native annual grasses. 33 non-native annual forbs. And there's a lot of biodiversity out there, a lot of native biodiversity and a lot of non-native biodiversity. But it gives us a sense of the palette we have and what we can work with to increase uh, the native component. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all these species uh, one by one, even though this is the crowd to do it on. Um, there's some really, really beautiful species out there. Um, some, some are quite common and widespread. Others are you know, relatively rare and you need to find them. Um, I really like the, uh, that little moth in the lower left. Um, because what we need to realize is that these plants support a food web. And the food web of insects supports the birds, et cetera, et cetera. And it's all part of the web of life. That uh, is what we're really trying to uh, conserve. Uh, there are some fantastic stands of uh, native perennial bunch grasses. That's a stand of uh, stipopulchra there uh, on the upper right. Um, a bunch more of the little moths on the golden yarrow. And, you know, what I love going out there with my camera and just getting these contrasts of colors, you know, like the, uh, you know, the white, uh, of the pseudo naphthalium with the lupins in the background, um, always on the lookout for these just beautiful color combinations. So this is one of the few graphs I'm going to show, uh, showing across all of our rapid assessment plots, the, the blue parts of the bars are the natives, the annual forbs, perennial forbs, and perennial grasses, the relative percent cover. And the brown part are the non-native annual forbs and non-native annual grasses. And then we have the thatch, which is a big component out there, and then the bare ground. Uh, we have quite a range of some sites are completely dominated by uh, native plants. Uh, these tended to be some of the moist swale areas where things like uh, creeping wild rye and some of the sedges and rushes are really good at keeping the non-natives out. But then we have some sites where Naria native plants is to be found, but there's a really wide range. So our overall goal is to figure out how to like increase the blue and decrease the brown in uh, 
this graph. And you know, I, I will admit we went out and when we would find we would find the best sites in various parts of the park. So this is not a truly representative sample. This is uh, often the best of the of, of what's left, but that's what we really wanted to document. But you know, we, we have a lot of sites where we do get you know 30 plus percent native cover. So what I'm gonna really get, dive into now are the experiments we ran in 2021, uh, hydromechanical pulverization. Uh, and this is a uh, Creekside you know, group project um, funded by, well, I'll get to that at the end. Uh, you know, really have to thank Crystal and Jimmy, Marissa and Chris for uh, kind of pulling off the operational aspect of this and actually getting it done. Uh, they worked really, really hard um, to make this come off. So uh, thinking about California grassland restoration, um, it really is one of the great ecological and restoration challenges because California grasslands are probably the archetypical novel ecosystem where we have a mix of non-native naturalized species that aren't going away uh, mixed in with a uh, remnant of the native flora and it just becomes a very different system than it was uh, prior to uh, Europeans showing in terms of grassland restoration, there's a lot of weed specific um, you know, techniques um, targeted in particular species. Um, we found that serpentine grassland is relatively straightforward to restore. Well-timed mowing really knocks back the non-native grasses or grazing selectively goes after the non-native grasses. And there aren't a lot of uh, non-native forbs to take the place. Now, fertile grasslands are a lot more difficult to restore um, because you can get rid of, say, the non-native grasses, um, but the non-native forbs take over. So it's playing what you might call the weed of the month club. Uh, you're just getting into a cycle of replacing one non-native with another non-native. And um, especially if you don't want to completely nuke the site, there is a uh, school of grassland restoration, which takes like, you know, really bad sites where there really aren't any natives or hardly any. Um, and they, you scrape it down, you herbicide it for a couple of years, then you treat it like an agricultural field, drill seed in your native grasses, and, um, keep spraying to get rid of the non-native forbs using a forb specific herbicide, and then you can plant in your native, uh, native forbs, but it's, that's not gonna happen at Edgewood. We have too much that's already out there that we really want to uh, nurture. And, uh, you know, there's some excellent studies uh, about uh, the wide ranging. And one of the take home is that the results are really very site specific and often very year dependent. If you get a drought year, you're going to get a different response than if you have a deluge year. So it's an incredibly variable system of in space from site to site and then from year to year because of the dominance of a lot of annual species. So we went and looked at all the experiments and trials we've done over the years at various sites and looked at, cast a really wide net to see what the, um, you know, what techniques have provided results. I'm uh, not really going to go through all of these. Uh, there's a lot of things that we've tried and other people have tried. 
And what we found is this technique called hydromechanical pulverization, uh, formerly known as hydromechanical obliteration, uh, basically pressure washing the grassland post germination. So we wait for the first rains to come through. And then we basically blast it with a pressure washer, uh, get a little bit more into it. And it takes out all of the germinating annuals. So the reason we went, we decided to pursue this further is that um, we had a 2014 uh, trial. And when we looked at it in 2018, at the beginning of the green grass project, we still had 29% native cover. Uh, we had 10% native perennial forbs. A lot of that was the yarrow that we had seeded in. 18% uh, native annual forbs. Uh, we had created enough space uh, so that these native annuals could uh, thrive. Um, a lot of that was uh, maybe a gracilis, but there was a pretty wide diversity of those. The technique creates a lot of disturbance, so we want to be really wary about weeds uh, being able to invade. Um, that's one of the reasons why Edgewood is great for doing this, is that the thistles are largely gone, the non-native thistles. So we do have an opportunity uh, to create a lot of disturbance without, no, without it getting invaded by the thistles. And uh, this works best in sites that already have uh, native perennial cover, you know, relatively high native perennial cover, because it uh, basically gets rid of the annual competition early in the year and the native perennials can expand vegetatively and take up more space. That, that's the long-term goal of um, long-term strategy of what we're trying to do is we want to take up the space with native perennials because they can stand up to the uh, non-native animals and can thrive when we uh, have to kind of re re-disturb the area. So taking up the space is what's most important in the long run. So we picked eight different sites to do the trial on. Uh, they're all kind of different. You know, we're trying to represent a lot of the diversity in the fertile grasslands out at Edgewood. Uh, there are somewhat different soil types. Um, we have some that are on soils derived from the Franciscan greenstone, some from the Franciscan gray wacky. We have uh, a relatively moist site in the Yampa Meadow. Uh, down at the Butterfly Gates, uh, South Hill. It's a funky uh, metamorphosed greenstone with a little bit of serpentine influence in it. So we wanted to try this out in um, a lot of different uh, areas that are somewhat representative of the fertile grasslands out there and see what the different results are. In each of the sites, we set out six seven by seven meter squares and we applied five treatments and then we have a control. Uh, so the, I'll get to what the treatments are. Um, you know, this was classic randomized block design experiments where we lay out the plots and randomly assign them to the different uh, treatments to avoid uh, kind of inherent bias that people will have. So here are our uh, treatments. We have the HMP, hydromechanical pulverization, with a commercial seed mix. We scoured the Hedgerow Farms uh, list of available uh, seeds, and we really only, we only wanted seeds that were locally produced or locally enough produced. Um, in San Mateo County and Santa Clara County. So we were able to get Clarkia purpurea, 
Leia, uh, Lupinus bicolor, Microsoceros paglassii, Plantago erecta. Uh, we provided them with uh, enough seeds of Acalea millifolium, yarrow, that they could grow it out. And we came back with over 90 pounds of that. And, uh, it was pretty amazing how that was amplified. Uh, Escholtzia, you know, poppies, uh, blue-eyed grass, and purple needle grass. So we also did uh, HMP and added in what we call our boutique seeds, and I'll be talking more about that later. Um, then we uh, have a technique we call scrub mow or close mow, and we had that with commercial seed and without commercial seed. We also did a kind of a traditional spring mow just to contrast it with our method. The spring mow was timed to hit the uh, brachypodium in particular. And then we have the control, so we have something to measure where we did, didn't do anything. So a little bit more on the hydromechanical pulverization. Uh, we, we have a pressure washer on a trailer. Uh, it, we're using a rotary nozzle that um, is commonly known as an asphalt excavating nozzle. Um, this thing will manage to dig through really, really tough areas. So it doesn't take that much to pulverize the tender young sprouts coming up from the ground and the thatch. Uh, it's just pure water. Uh, we were able to get a fire hydrant meter, construction meter, so we could fill up at the uh, fire hydrant right by the sunset gate. We have a 500 gallon water buffalo that was provided by County Parks. Um, and, you know, County Parks was so supportive of this. Um, my hat's off to them. It takes about, with our current rig, about a gallon to do a square meter, about 20 minutes to do 50 square meters, and we're running it at about 3,500 PSI. So uh, here's what it looks like after we do the uh, HMP and we lay down our commercial seed mix and put some rice straw on it. The rice straw can help protect the seeds from all the birds that like to come in and eat them. Uh, helps retain a little bit of moisture. Uh, pretty standard restoration practice. Um, the spreading the straw and the seed uh, involved a lot of volunteers from Friends of Edgewood. Thank you all. Um, this work would not be possible without the amazing volunteers. Then uh, we wanted to try some other techniques. We came up with the idea of what we call a scrub mow. Um, it's a string cutter attachment, really gnarly wire brush head, uh, thinking that this could uh, be effective in taking out the freshly germinating animals. Um, we found in practice that it was hard, it was difficult to get a consistent treatment, um, it was really wearing on the operator, this thing is bouncing up and down, and uh, could even be a little hazardous because little rocks would go flying. And uh, we thought it would be you know, a lot faster and more straightforward than the HMP, but it didn't turn out that the execution was, uh, was very good. So um, and as you'll see, uh, we are not doing this anymore. Here's what it looks like after you scrub mow. Uh, you end up with a lot of uh, beat up thatch. Um, 
for seeding purposes, we had to rake the thatch off. This was done by park interns and volunteers. We put the seed down and then we redistributed it. Um, if we were going to implement this, we would probably end up using a leaf blower to do that aspect of it. So one of the things about the HMP is that it uh, yeah, it takes off the above ground sprouts of the na of the native uh, perennials, but they come roaring back. So here we are in the mules ear meadow in early spring, and all of that green, shiny plant in there is narrow leaf mules ear. Um, it loved getting rid of us getting rid of all of the uh, competition of the ground and really thrive vegetatively. Um, and we got really dense flowering stands of it a little later in the year. Um, you can see the rice straw there. This is the uh, HMP plus uh, commercial seed mix with the straw. You know, we look up, look close, um, and we had a really like spectacular response from the Mulesiers. In the Yampa Meadow, which is uh, a low-lying swale, uh, very clay soils, uh, one of the dominant native plants is uh, is Yampa um, Terroridia pelagii. Uh, um, which is actually uh, used to be a major food source for the indigenous people around the version of carrots. Um, so you can see that the yampa has uh, survived and is re-sprouting uh, quite vigorously. Be getting close. Uh, on the left, you can see the yampa shoots coming out uh, just a few months after the uh, treatment. We had a nice patch of soap root, chlorogalum, in there, and that came roaring back. Uh, one of the things, if you look at the chlorogalum, you'll see a lot of the leaf tips are chewed off. It gets, uh, gets browsed by deer a lot. It's actually one of the major uh, food sources out there. And then this is what it looked like in the spring with the HMP and commercial seed. Um, the Leia did really, really well. Um, it was quite obvious, um, those of you who were out there walking along that trail in the background, see the big yellow square of of Leia among the Yampa and the straw, but, but wait, there's more. We get in close and we can see the other animals in our seed mix. We have some Plantago erecta, some Microceros uh, glassii, and uh, Parkia purpurea, which are growing quite densely in this uh, area. We, we actually seeded them in at a very, very high rate because we wanted to use all of our seed. Uh, so uh, that worked really well. We created a great seed bed and got a good response from our native uh, annuals that we had at the seed mix. Here in the upper Mules Ear Meadow. Um, this is an area that had been treated with HMP back in around 2014, 2012, 2014. I've kind of lost track of I have that written down somewhere. And we seeded in um, yarrow in particular. Um, this also has really nice stands of bunch grasses. So uh, this is a good example of uh, kind of a couple months, about a month after we laid down the seed and we got that big rainstorm in January, kind of the only big rainstorm of the year. Uh, you can see how densely we seeded in the native animals here. They, they're growing like gangbusters. And then the 
uh, Yalpa, uh, not the, the Yarrow really responded strongly. Um, and that was a species that we had seeded in like five or six years ago, actually more than that. So, um, and you can see over here, here's a purple needle grass that's re-sprouting vigorously. So we are getting responses from the native perennials, which is a really important component for this. Uh, here's the HMP without the seed. Um, again, we have the arrow responding really strongly. Uh, here's some blue-eyed grass. Uh, we had blue-eyed grass in the seed mix, but this is uh, a plant that was already there and responded really strongly vegetatively. Uh, we don't expect to see much results from the perennial seedings for at least at least the second year, but probably the third or fourth year. It takes a while for them to get going. But here's where we uh, came across one of our weed issues. Uh, the erodium in the untreated areas was really quite dense. Uh, some parts of the HMP, we didn't get it all. Um, erodium actually sends down a pretty major taproot early on, and uh, unless you catch it really early, some of it survives. And with the lack of competition, the individual plants did really, really well. Talk a little bit more about uh, uh, post-HMP weed uh, control. Here's a result of the scrub mow um, at junction nine, which is a very, very uh, a bunch grass rich site. Uh, this was an opportunity to experiment with the techniques in an area that had like really dense stands, uh, mixed stands of Stipa lepida and Stipa pulchra. Uh, one of the uh, parts of our voyage of discovery doing the rapid assessment plots was just how many nice stands of Stipa lepida foothill beetle grass are out there at Edgewood. And they tend to occupy the marginally wetter spots within the grassland and form really, really dense stands. Um, I really learned to appreciate that species. Um, both at Edgewood and now my eyes are out for it in a lot of places. Uh, here we can see that we have all the duff the, the thatch that's left over from the scrub mow, but the chlorogalum did really well. Uh, a lot of individuals here and the bunch grasses uh, you know, just uh, re-sprouted quickly. So they got a jump on things. And uh, overall, I'm just gonna show, you know, the overall results here. So we have the control and the four different treatments and the different colors here. And this is comparing the native versus the non-native. So in the control sites where we didn't do anything, that's kind of the current condition of most of Edgewood's grassland, we had about 13% native cover, which is actually pretty good for fertile grasslands. Um, we were picking places that already had a fair amount so that's uh, quite deliberate, but there was still 66% non uh, The HMP plus uh, boutique seed, which is, again, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but it was much lighter seeding, uh, had about 24, 25% native cover, about 31% non-native cover, uh, the HMP plus the commercial seed is where we really, really nailed it. That is the blue here. We have 41% native cover and less than 10% non-native cover in that first year. Uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty spectacular results. Uh, the scrub mow, 
Uh, we didn't do, we reduced the non-native cover a little bit. Uh, didn't really increase the native cover. And then the scrub mode plus commercial seed did increase the native cover. Um, mainly because of the native forbs that we put in. Um, and that also seemed to knock back the non native cover. So here, here's the ratio between native and non native. So we have 20% you know, native to non native. We got that up to 81% with just the HMP and a very light seeding. When we put the heavy duty commercial seed on there, uh, you know, just through the roof. And then the scrub mow um, had more marginal yields. So we're really pleased with the HMP plus, uh, the, plus the commercial seed. Uh, we definitely had some plots where uh, things like the brachypodium came back really strongly. We didn't get rid of it completely. Um, this is uh, HMP. Uh, with boutique seed, so very light seeding. Uh, one of the great things about the seeding is that the native annuals really suppress the non-native annual forbs and non-native annual grasses. Um, they're good competitors in that first year. So uh, that suppression is really, really important and hopefully will carry through in time. Um, we also had some tocolote and a few plots. So I think um, we're going to figure out how to unleash Paul Hypo and the leaders on some of these weeds in our HMP plots to kind of nail the tocolote before it uh, really produces a lot of seed. I know it's a really hard plant to get rid of because it immediately produces a cleistogamous seed uh, at ground level, but uh, we can stop it from really spreading. Uh, and then where we have remnant erodium, the plants are large enough individually that with the hori hori or the cloud or some tool, uh, we should be able to knock that back before it sets seed. So I want to talk about seed collection and amplification. Um, you know, what we're really trying to generate here at Edgewood is what I call a more indigenous approach. So everything starts with field collection. Uh, we go out, we find stands of the desirable species. We pretty, it's pretty severe limitations on the amounts that we're allowed to collect. Um, I have some issues with that, with the perennials in particular. But, uh, you know, so you collect as much as you can. Sometimes it's really painstaking, like collecting Lasthenia is painfully slow. And then there are different places we can put the seeds. Uh, we can use some in the native garden by the uh, Ed Center, which might is going to end up being a good source of uh, some of the seeds. We can put it into Edgewood Farms. Um, I'll show you a lot about uh, Edgewood Farms, our seed production beds. And then if we can collect enough from the field, we can send it to Hedgerow Farms for a professional amplification. Uh, we did that with Yarrow. Uh, that was the only species we could collect enough. We spent $8,000 but we came back with nearly 100 pounds of yarrow seed. Um, so that worked really, really well. Um, but we can't do that with very many seeds. So another route is we amplify it at Edgewood Farms, then generate enough to send the hedgerow. Uh, talk a little bit later about uh, possibilities of CMPS helping us uh, get a few species going. And then, of course, we want to get it back into the field. 
Now, eventually, what we would like to be able to do is, you know, go from our field seeding, field collection in those sites where we have dense stands of natives, and use those directly um, without having to go through Edgewood farms or hedgerow farms or native gardens. But that's like a long term goal. So, you know, thinking about which species are appropriate here for the different treatments, um, kind of a group effort, and we're learning a lot about propagation and seed amplification. So again, the field seeding is the ultimate goal. And, uh, if we can diversify by seeding, uh, we, uh, we shied away as a lot of restorationists are from generating plugs and putting those out because of issues with transmitting disease, uh, Phycophthora and other pathogens. So um, this was our first year seed uh, production, uh, seed collection, uh, you know, hats off to Perry McCarty who uh, really spearheaded this, but it had a lot of volunteers in here. So, you know, we have about 21 different species that we uh, collected seeds of in the first year. And this gives a sense of how many we were able to uh, collect from the seed, from the field. Then uh, we built, Edgewood Farms, um, I, I'm using the royal we here that uh, I didn't do this, but uh, the community did. Uh, interns with San Mateo County Park that built, built raised beds, uh, filled them with soil and planted seeds. I'm sorry, I had that in reverse, and filled the beds with nice soil. Um, wire protection to um, keep the gophers out from coming in from below. Um, yes, and the gophers made their way in. Uh, hopefully they will be kept out of the seed beds, uh, which is actually evidence of some success that we've created something the gophers like. Uh, we also had a deer break into the farm and watch some of our tender young plants. Uh, if you go to the farm, you'll see there's a pretty major deer fence uh, up that uh, got much better at making sure it's secure. Uh, yeah, there are the deer in the picnic area, the day camp. Uh, just waiting for their chance to get into the uh, Edgewood farms and also the uh, native garden. Here's an example of some of the success in June. Uh, here we have uh, Cydalcia diplosica and uh, Clarkia rubicunda. So uh, Clarkia rubicunda I was just talking with uh, Vivian before we uh, got on, and we think that is a target species for uh, sending enough to hedgerow for them to have to do a quarter acre of it, and uh, then send the seed back to us because uh, beautiful species and having locally grown, locally sourced. Clarkia rubicunda would just be a great thing for the chapter to distribute and to use in large amounts at Edgewood. We'll get that discussion going uh, soon. Another species that was really successful uh, was Lastenia. Um, but I was kind of surprised the uh, hedgerow didn't have uh, lastenia for San Mateo or Santa Clara counties. So we ended up growing it ourselves uh, really quite successful. Um, so painstaking collection of it in the field, we planted a few beds of it 
and collecting it was really, really fast once it went to seed. So uh, here's Perry photo documented this beautifully. Uh, it's how much we were able to collect in, he was able to collect in five minutes and then about 20 minutes of collection got these three bags. Um, so we really like Latinia. Um, in the boutique seeded plots, it did really well. So where we did the HMP and then spread our Lastenia seed, it was visible. Uh, just really nice. Uh, if we look close in, you know, it's pretty high density, and each of these plants is producing a dozen or more seeds. So it's going to reseed itself really well. Uh, this was uh, North Central Ridge, which was uh, which was the site where we had the best HMP results from back in 2014. And uh, we can see that uh, we had uh, the Micropus, the slender cottonweed, uh, did really well with the HMP. Uh, native animal that survived the treatment and came back really strongly. And this is where uh, we had some good success with the Clarkia rubicunda. Uh, so a little bit later in the year when it was in flower. So you know, we love Clarkia rubicunda. It's what I call a high coefficient of beauty species because it's just so beautiful in your face. A little later in the year when colors are fading. Um, and can often find it in bloom, like well into August or even September. Uh, the perennials are coming along. Uh, we, this is an example of a perennial that we uh, planted the first year and actually produced a lot of seed the first year, the bristly golden aster, the heterotheca. Uh, the various progressions here and then uh, you know, by uh, looks like September, I was ready to harvest and uh, ended up getting a lot of heterotheca seeds. This is one of those species that seems to have a real preference for the soils that are derived from the Franciscan greenstone um, on either side of the North Central Ridge. So that's where we really targeted seeding this species. It's probably going to take a little bit longer uh, to exhibit itself in the field. We planted stuff during you know, a record drought year. So uh, you know, the annuals did pretty well. We're not sure how the perennials did that first year. So uh, you know, here are some of our initial conclusions. Um, that the HMP with the commercial seeds is really the best treatment throughout all the blocks. Uh, we didn't see huge, you know, it, it failing miserably in some of the soil types. Led to the best reduction in non-native grasses and forbs. The, the seeding we did really suppress the non-native ends. The comparison between the HMP with commercial seeds and the HMP with the light boutique seeding. Uh, the biggest difference was the non-native annuals uh, were suppressed by the commercial seeding. And the native perennials maintained their cover. Um, we didn't see a really strong response vegetatively. Um, and we're doing this in a record drought year, so uh, that might change. The scrub mow was not as effective and was more difficult to do. Uh, it was really hard on the operators and potentially quite dangerous with little rocks flying around. As far as the seeds go, you know, we want to continue purchasing locally sourced seeds uh, and think about particular species that would be worth sending to Hedra. I really wish there was a seed production company that uh, could work at a smaller scale than Hedro does, 
but at a larger scale than we're able to do, but um, there's not really a niche for that. We won't really know about the success with perennials for another year or two. They just and then enhancing the diversity with the boutique seeds from Edgewood Farms. Um, you know, we were able to see some of the seeds uh, we produced you know, be successful. And then with the weeds, uh, we didn't really see the strong weed response to disturbance. Uh, and, it, you know, it's because of all the weed control that's been done by the Edgewood Weed Warriors. We don't have to issue. You know, the, the species that we did have an issue with, uh, Tocolote in a couple of spots, and, uh, really difficult to control by hand, and then uh, the Brachypodium, uh, especially where we uh, just did the HMP without the seeds. So we were so thrilled, and the Friends of Edgewood were so thrilled, we decided to scale it up in 2021. So here's uh, Marissa and Crystal blasting the grassland. Uh, some interested uh, horse riders in the background. You can see the pressure washer back there. Uh, they're blasting away. Uh, this gives a really good sense of some of the ergonomics we had to deal with. Uh, our first year was really hard on the operators, so we kind of made a sling with a belt. And then uh, we found we had to put weights on the end of the pressure washer uh, to keep it down because you're blowing water out there at more than 3,500 uh, pounds per square inch. And uh, actually, it was quite an effort to keep it down. So some scuba weights, I believe, Crystal figured out. There's Jimmy looking dapper in his cowboy hat there. There's Marissa cutting a fine figure. Uh, everybody agreed that it was a great way to take out your aggressions. You know, it's just you're blasting away. Uh, you couldn't do it for really long periods, you'd get tired. That's why we had shifts. So, you know, we're working out the uh, operational logistics of how to do this. Uh, Jimmy was shuttling water back and forth from fire hydrants. Uh, definitely muddy boots. Um, it does, uh, does throw up a little bit of water. Uh, we calculate it's about five millimeters or about a, a fifth of an inch of water uh, going down. So it's enough to wet things up, but it's not enough to run off. So we really have not had any erosion issues. And we uh, set out to do blocks of 900 square meters in the various sites or you know, somewhere close to that compared with our 50 square meters that we did in 2020. So we really went all out. We had what we called HMP week. We rented the pressure washers and uh, Jimmy stayed in the Best Western in Redwood City, um, and the rest of the crew kind of cycled in and out for their every other day of work. So uh, you know, the operational aspects of this were learning a lot. Uh, here we are looking at the north side of the South Hill. Uh, the boutique seeds, the second year of growing, uh, I'm not going to go through this list. We increased our diversity, uh, got seeds of a lot of different species. And you know, some of these we didn't get a huge amount. Uh, others we did really well, like the Clarkia rubicunda. Um, so these are being distributed either very targeted or uh, in strips. 
so we know where we put in, especially the uh, perennials. And uh, yeah, so again, uh, hats off to Perry and the people who worked at Edgewood Farms on our seed application. And I, I think this is an opportunity uh, to learn a lot about our native species. You know, those of you who've grown native plants realize how much you learn trying to grow them. Um, so uh, I think there's an amazing educational opportunity here um, as we we find this, um, I think we're going to start getting some of the more of the perennials from Edgewood Farms producing seeds. He's very excited about getting some uh, blue dicks here, uh, the Piclostoma. Uh, and yeah, so we're the 2022 crop is uh, either going in the ground or is already in the ground. So Edgewood Farms is being expanded with help from folks. So just a few, you know, observations of, you know, how we approach this. We do the experiments to inform whether the technique should be scaled up. We drop the things that don't work. And this time we scaled up five times larger um, at each block. So uh, actually more than that. So uh, you know we now have some substantial areas to play with. Uh, targeting the HMP for areas with high native perennial cover is our strategy. Hopefully, we'll be seeing a good vegetative response. And you know, Edgewood's a special place because we don't have to worry about the, as Crystal calls it, particularly egregious weeds. And it really is the foundation for this was set by the decades of weed work. And we're really pleased at how the seeding of, of the native animals suppress the non-native animals. Uh, gives us a gives us a jump of a year on occupying the space um, and not letting the non-native animals come back too strongly. So uh, this work would not have been possible without the kind of full-throated support of Friends of Edgewood, uh, the Weed Management Area, California Native Plant Society, the uh, San Mateo County Parks Department, San Mateo County Parks Foundation, uh, Friends of Edgewood got a grant from the National Environmental Education Foundation. Um, and one, uh, one thing I do want to specifically mention is that the CNPS chapter uh, supported us uh, with a $5,000 grant. And what we're gonna use that money in particular for is writing up an article in Grasslands, the journal of the California Native Grasslands Society. So we can share the, uh, share the knowledge with the broader community. And I think that's a really good use of the money that uh, you provided so thank you. Thank you, Stu. That was great. It's so good to hear some good news for a change uh, yeah. on, about on restoration. A medium, on a medium scale. You know. Right. Um, so I think you can stop sharing there. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. So we have a few uh, questions from yeah, YouTube. Um, and we have a lot of the Edgewood, the Edgewood uh, leaders here. So that's I, good too. I noticed that <laughs> in the participants list. But we've got even more people on YouTube. So um, so what percentage of, of the 467 is actually serpentine soils? Wow. Um, that's a really good question. Maybe about a third. Mm -hmm. um, when we did a bunch of soil tests, 
in the grassland. Um, and, you know, like this part of California, it's a melange of so many different things and defining what's actually serpentine and what's not serpentine. What's the indicator? Is it the nickel content? Is it the calcium to magnesium ratio? And in some places we have like a slope wash of greenstone uh, soil over a serpentine bedrock. So, you know, it's, a, it's not a, it not depends. a real <laughs> answer there. It's a mess. It's not, it's not, it's a lot of gray area and uh, yeah. mix up. Yeah. Good. Um, so the hydromechanical method, does it also take out, it you mentioned the, um, the non-native annuals. Does it also take out the native annuals? Uh, yes, it will. That's why we're hoping we don't have to retreat very often. Mm -hmm. And then we're also really trying to get the treatment in as soon after germination, mm -hmm. you know, as possible. We got to give it some time to, for things to germinate. But a lot of the natives have kind of a delayed germination, uh, a little bit more kind of seed banking. Mm -hmm. So uh, we hope we're not gonna just completely wipe those out. So even though there's a lot of non-native grasses, there are native annual seeds in the seed bank still. Like if you were to burn- yeah, we, we, we think so. Um, I mean, I don't think there's some miraculous seed bank mm -hmm. out there that we're going to liberate. I think we've, we, you know, we've done enough mm -hmm. that, yeah, there's, you know, you'll find the species out there, but it's not going to like let a thousand flowers bloom right. um, from something that's been sitting there for a hundred years. Yeah, I just don't. Uh, some places, I've not it, seen evidence of that. Right. Um, how do you the plants grown at Edgewood Farms? How do you thresh and clean those seeds? How does the how are the seeds extracted from those plants? Oh man, I, I'll have to leave that to I should leave that to Perry uh, painstakingly. Uh, no, in some cases it's really pretty easy. Uh, you just mm -hmm. scoop up all of the. Uh, Lastenia. Others, uh, you know, you'd like bag the seed heads um, and, you know, because things like the Clarkia, the seeds burst and mm -hmm. go all over the place. So um, I, uh, I, you know, figuring all of that stuff out, um, again, I just think uh, Perry has really taken this on and figured out a lot of this stuff and has put in like a huge amount of time. And it probably period. depends on which, which plant you're talking about. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I, everything's different. Right. Um, and they bloom at different times. So you mentioned commercial seeds. Somebody just wanted a clarification on that. Um, could you just reiterate what you said about commercial seeds? Uh, okay. So the there are native seeds available commercially. A uh, pretty wide palette of species, but we wanted to restrict ourselves to locally sourced seed, um, which meant San Mateo or Santa Clara County. So uh, there's a firm, a company called Hedro Farms, uh, that actually just got bought by uh, Pacific Coast Seed that is in the business of providing native seeds. They have a huge operation up in Yolo County. Uh, they produce seed for restoration and they'll do custom grows. So if we provide them with enough seed to do a quarter acre, they'll grow it out. And that uh, I think that's about $8,000. If we don't have enough seed for that full uh, quarter acre, we can give them some seeds. They'll grow plugs and do an initial uh, um, you know, seed amplification to get that up mm -hmm. to a quarter mm -hmm. acre's worth of seed. And that's like another $6,000. So you know, it's, it's, it's not cheap to get not, custom seeds. Not cheap. 
It's it's a yeah. it's possible for a large. I imagine a lot of, a lot of large restoration projects and commercial yeah. area, commercial projects. So, um, do you plan to chart, treat larger swaths of land in Edgewood in the future, or? Oh, um, you know, we're gonna see how our forty five hundred square meters. That's like one point one one acres plus the small areas we did last year um yeah so you know as long as we get enough funding to like do an hmp week each year i think we'll be able to you know get a marginal increase in the amount that we can do i, mean, I don't want to bother you with all the logistical difficulties we had with rented pressure washers oh. <laughs> uh, it sounds like a better a better talk for the uh, uh calypsy conference yeah yeah definitely <laughs> Um, so when is peak seed collection around here? Is it oh, in the yeah. summer mostly, but right? No, it's uh, all the species specific. Um, you know, one of the species we really, really like, uh, I, I didn't have a special highlight on it, but uh, I love the media elegans. Mm. Uh, it's, it provides color really late in the year when there's mm -hmm. nothing else out there. And it seems like it uh, performs really well, even in untreated areas. So we're hoping that, uh, uh, you know, it, it, the stands of it that are in the native plant garden when they don't get eaten by the deer mm -hmm. um, can provide a really good seed source. But we managed to get uh, that species established in all of the plots uh, where we did the boutique seeds. And you know, our, our hope is that the awesome reproductive powers of some of these native plants will be able to express themselves in the few years that we have this uh, you know, open habitat that's really good for seeding. I think we uh, it'd be nice to use more Madia elegans in gardens around here too. I think. Um, yeah, I think so too. I mean, it's it's one of those species you you know just give it a little bit of water, it stays mm. really lush. It's it's very and spectacular. It's, it's so in your it's so colorful. Yeah. It's cool. it's... Super plant. Um, so I was wondering if is Edgewood or uh, are you participating in the um, seed banking, rare plant seed banking project with CNPS? And I think it's the Center for Plant Conservation. Do you know about uh, that? Yeah, yeah, for the rare plants. Um, yeah, that's always part of our rare plant, uh, you know, feral plant uh, projects. We're working with the Thorn Mint. We're working with the uh, Metcalf Canyon Jewel Flower, mm -hmm. Paintbrush. Um, yeah. Hopefully, we'll be working with the white ray pentakita. Um, we always include in our proposals the money necessary to send stuff off to the seed bank. Good, that's great. It's a resource yeah. a lot of people aren't aware of. So glad yeah. to hear it. Um, have you tried this on compact soils? And uh, that's one question. Um, we'll answer that, I guess. Yeah. Um, no, uh, we. We really haven't tried it on compacted soils. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, at Edgewood, we have some old road beds, uh, which are actually kind of nice hot spots of certain native species like uh, Danthonia. Really, uh, California oak grass really seems to like the old road beds where it's compacted and a little moist. Um, and we, you know, we, think that, uh, you know, it might be a really good, uh, good thing to try. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I really want to do next year is, in addition to these larger areas, just uh, figure out how to take the time to do some spot treatments just to see how does this work in a stand of this species, you know, that's not necessarily in our bigger plots. Um, let's try it on a scale of, you know, take 20 minutes and do 50 square meters. So 
you know. That'll be interesting. Uh, There's always more, yeah. always more hypotheses to try yeah. out and see. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, we're going to end up with different weather years. So yeah, I'm hoping we'll get a little bit more rain this year, but it sounds I like it's so coming. Too. So we've got a couple more minutes and a couple more questions. Is that okay? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally open to okay. you know, answering questions here. Great. Uh, I had a question about what is the what are the issues with sheet mulching and then reseeding? Did you talk about uh, sheet mulching? Well, it's like kind of like we call that tarping, I think, mm. you know, where, you know, you put down a uh, down weed cloth. I assume that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And you leave it for a while. Right. That's, uh, you know, that gets hard to scale up beyond a few tens of square meters. Uh, we had done some experiments with that up in the Presidio with Lou Stringer, and it actually turned out to be. Uh, quite effective as a post-germination treatment. So you let the things germinate, hit them with the tarp, have it on there for a few weeks, kills off the annuals, the perennials are just like way biding their time. Um, and, uh, they're actually using that at Serpentine Prairie, uh, not Serpentine, uh, Inspiration Point. In which oh, is a small, in very small, yeah, a very small serpentine grassland, mm -hmm. and it's really good for the Presidio clarpia. So it's become oh. sort of the standard rotational method. Do you Those mean days. Do you mean the serpentine prairie in, in in Berkeley in Oakland? No, 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 no. This Inspiration Point in the Presidio. Oh, okay. I think they have Presidio clarpia in Oakland. Yeah, yeah, they also do there. Okay. But, mm -hmm. uh, there, it's been uh, sheep grazing. Uh, uh, maybe some mowing have been uh, and scattering seeds collected on site and rescattering them. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, this is my question: Is if so, you're a pollinator guy, you're a butterfly guy. Uh, are you noticing any change, or is it too early to notice any change in pollinator density or or species uh, in the I treated just, areas? You know, I I couldn't tell you. Uh, you know, monitoring insects and pollinators is like this whole separate thing. Um, just going to kind of go on the assumption that more flowers mean more pollinators. Mm -hmm. That's that's a good, I, I'm going to go with that. I'm gonna... Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> sure. and if, if somebody wants to sit there and count could be an Eagle Scout project or something, yeah. Yeah, although, boy, when you get into, like, the native bees, mm. it's, they're really hard to identify. Yeah. Uh, you need a real specialist, so. Not a lot of pins. Um, okay, here's one that I think you have addressed many other times. This is the last question I have. Um, uh -huh. We've heard, uh, they've heard that there's a the problem with the serpentine soil invasive species is from increased nitrogen deposition, as you know. Yeah. Um, is there a technique to denourishing the soil or de-fertilizing the soil from nitrogen? Yeah, uh, quick answer is not at scale. Um, the, it is possible to like put in things like wood chips really high carbon substrates will tie up a lot of nitrogen for a certain time period. Um, that's again a really hard thing to do at scale. Mm -hmm. Cattle grazing uh, is actually a net export of nitrogen, not at the scale at which the deposition is taking place, but uh, that's taking some out but what's really what the cattle do is that selective herbivory on the grasses you know they the cows eat grass mm -hmm. so um, then they leave the forbs alone unless they're really desperate uh there actually is export out of uh, the serpentine soils on coyote ridge uh into the shallow groundwater 
those soils are leaching nitrate. This is a project we've been working on for a few years. And I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, we have, we have springs on Tulare Hill and low on Coyote Ridge, close to San Jose, where the uh, nitrate concentration in the ground bar has been five parts per million uh, nitrate as nitrogen, which is half the drinking water standard. Hmm. And my colleagues in the nitrogen business are absolutely blown away by that because they start worrying when you hit one part per million. That's a sign of nitrogen saturation. So uh, that's uh, it's a whole subject. Uh, yeah, that's a whole that's a whole a lot of very difficult to read papers <laughs> for the rest of yeah. for us civilians here. <laughs> that's great. That's great uh, to know about that. The research though you're doing there. Yeah. Um, so this project, when this technique, it was a small project and it needed a, relatively for Edgewood being a very compact area and, and, and took a lot of, took some funding. So it wouldn't necessarily be scalable to someplace like the non-serpentine areas on Coyote, uh, say the fertile areas on Coyote Ridge, for example, that are, have a lot of not uh, non-native invasives, but surrounded by serpentine. It wouldn't be scalable to something like that, would it be? Um, you know, if. If you were, say, the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority or mid and you could invest in the equipment and, and the time, uh, you know, you could do a pretty good amount over the course of a, you know, a few weeks in the fall after the germination. You know, we're... This is only our second year of figuring out how to scale it up, but you know, you're gonna have to have like $20,000 to buy a good pressure washer rig. Right. But that's a capital investment. So you know, using it a lot hmm. over many years, it'll pay for, you know, pay for itself. And right. I think what we're really trying to do is demonstrate long lasting results. Yes. And that's what makes it worth spending, you know, spending that much money per acre uh, is if you're getting results that are lasting you know, a really long time. So. That's great. Well, we, uh, we in the chapter appreciate uh, the update and uh, knowing what you're doing, and we're happy to support the project, I think. So, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, we, uh, again, we really like the idea of using your support, you know, that you've given us already and, uh, you know, writing a, writing a paper for Grasslands. It's great. Um, okay. Yeah. Terrific. I think that's all we, we got. Um, more. What's that? Oh, uh, we can talk more about that. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so, Madeline, you with the Maya Elegance background, do you have any, uh, did I miss anything or Vivian? Yeah, I think you've got everything. Okay. Uh, but I'm really excited about possibly collaborating on this seed amplification. Clarkia rubicunda, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's such a no brainer for enjoyment. Yes. The fact that, the fact that it's, it lasts so long in flower. You know, yeah. I mean, looking for you're looking for color in June and July. You, it's you like that. stunning. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I want to give a shout out to uh, Madia Elegance too because it, you know, if actually you can give it a little bit of water, it lasts a really long time, and it flowers at a time when many things are not flowering, and it's really beautiful and birds love the seeds mm -hmm. and it's reseeds so easily i think it's like when it's a really easy plant more people should use it yeah yeah we uh we i think we had been depending on the native garden for a lot of our seed this year but the deer really nailed it it's like an ice cream shop you've provided Okay. Well, thank you. Um, anything else, Vivian? Uh, well, I was just going to say that uh, for for those, this is really sort of an in crowd, I think. But for those of you who haven't been to Edgewood, I just wanted to say everybody should get out there and, and take a look at it. And, and you can see the plots, and there's 
you know, there's signage. It's just, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, there's even a little QR code you can hold your phone up to to get more information. And that a lot of that work is being funded by that uh, at NEF, National Environmental Education Foundation. Um, yeah, they, uh, Friends of Edgewood and the San Mateo County Parks Foundation put together this like ridiculously long application and got uh, somewhere on the order of $50,000. Very nice. Project and actually the farm was... too. Everybody should go take a look at the farm yeah. up there by the restrooms. <laughs> I'm sure uh, I'm sure Perry could use some uh, help. <laughs> yes, if anyone from uh, Edgewood wants to put the contact numbers or places to send your donations or anything like that, just feel free to put it in the chat. So. Um, okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Stu. It, this yeah, is thanks a for great thanks. update. Yeah, thanks for the audience. I just, uh, you know, you're my people. <laughs> We're all each other's people here. Absolutely. Okay. I see Ken and Dee Himes over there too. Yeah. Talk about our people. <laughs> uh, see, you, see you all out there over the course of this year. Perry's just put the uh, friendsofedgewood.org in the chat if anybody wants more information about this um, project, supporting this project or volunteering. Um, so thank you, Perry. And thank yeah. you for all your work and everyone else. Everyone else in the Zoom, mostly on the Zoom link, we don't know is that in the YouTube land, but thank you for uh, all your work out there. It is just a jewel. Edgewood is um, such a great, such an inspiring place. All right, everybody. Well, um... Hope to see have you guys a, out there. Have a have a good solstice season. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Enjoy. You know, do a rain dance to prepare yourself to receive the rain. That's <laughs> that's what rain dances are about. It has nothing to do with making it rain. Yeah. It's it's prepare. It, I, I learned that from an indigenous uh, person. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. 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 I, I think it's. Yeah. I, I just remember. You know, they're like, you know, people get this all wrong. I mean, we're not, we're not that naive. We don't, you know, it's, we're not making it rain. It's, it's all for us to learn, you know, to be prepared to receive it great, gratefully. I think that's a, that's a nice way of looking at it. And hopefully we'll be able to do that this weekend. <laughs> yes, this weekend. It's looking pretty good so far. Okay, folks. Well, I okay. think it is time to end our Zoom session. So thanks everybody for showing up and thank you, Stu, for the update and see you guys.